Let's talk about building dashboards. One place to put a dashboard would be on a separate tab from the model. So I could draw the dashboard here, do my math on the other sheet, and then I could go to View, New Window, View, Arrange All, and arrange the windows of the active workbook vertically. And what that does is give me two separate windows to see the same workbook. So if I type something here, it actually shows up in the other window because it's just the same file. If I want to look at the model in one of the windows and the dashboard in the other, then I can see two different sheets at the same time. That's pretty nice. I can even do some math and say, what would the sum of the revenue be? And I can refer to the other sheet to do some math. But when I hit F2, I don't see the blue range pop up for F12 through F16. Had I done the math over here, come back and hit F2, then I would see the blue range pop up. I'm really used to that when I'm editing formulas, so I don't like to have my dashboard on a separate sheet as my model. I'll delete it. I no longer need this extra window. So we'll go back to a single sheet. Now sometimes I can get away with inserting some rows, Control shift plus, and just putting the dashboard right above the model. But sometimes I regret that because I need to insert either another column in the model with Control shift plus, telling it to shift the cells right, and then numbers end up in a column perhaps with a different width than they had before. So I'll undo that. I could insert an entire column, and then the width goes along with the numbers, but now I've completely changed how my dashboard is laid out. So I don't like that too well either. What I do like is being able to I'm going to push this aside with Control Shift Plus, and then I'm going to come back. And since I've already started a dashboard, I'll Control X, Control V. Now I have complete control over my column widths inserting, deleting columns, and whatever happens on the dashboard will be unrelated to what happens in the model. It leaves a bit of white space up here and a bit of white space down here, which I guess I could put some notes up here, and I think I will put some linked cells down here. And this is the best practice that I'm going to recommend. Dashboard documentation or notes to tell us a little bit about the model, linked cells, and then the model itself. Now the model itself can go as far to the right and as far down as it wants to with this layout. And then we can always have the dashboard on the upper left so that when we select those cells and do an Alt WG or zoom to selection, then it can take up the whole screen. Now I got pretty lucky here. I chose some, an aspect ratio that happens to take up about the whole screen. The best practice here is to make it 16 by nine. The easiest way to see if it's 16 by 9 is to copy it, go to PowerPoint, create a new slide, and make sure that when you design that slide and go to slide size that you choose widescreen, which is already 16 by 9. If you choose standard, then you'll be working with 4 by 3, which is a little bit different. 16 by 9 tends to fit most monitors the best, and so that's what I'm asking for in this class. So we'll go to this slide. We'll do an Alt H, V for paste special, U for picture, and we'll paste our dashboard in as a picture. Now I'd like to, obviously it's not big enough to fill the whole slide, and that's okay. I just need to see if the aspect ratio is correct, if the width to height ratio is 1.77, which is 16 divided by 9. And so if I want to zoom in, or if I want to enlarge this, let me say, I just click on the corner, it enlarges the top and the right, but not the whole thing. But if I hold down the control key and then drag the corner, it enlarges the whole thing proportionately and lets me see what my dimensions are. Now, while it fit my screen in Excel because I had a ribbon up there, it's a little bit short for the width here. So I would want to come back to Excel and zoom out a bit and maybe insert a few rows. Zoom out some more, copy, delete, Alt-H-V-U, Control, click.
click and drag. And now I'm getting much closer to that 16 by 9 aspect ratio. It may be tempting to come in here and just drag it to the right ratio when you paste your slides into a PowerPoint. That doesn't help you display it in Excel in the right dimensions. And it's also going to drag your fonts. We don't have any fonts on here yet, but they would be skewed. It would be tall and skinny at this point. So we don't want that. So once you've chosen a place for your dashboard and gotten the general aspect ratio at about 1.77, which is 16 divided by 9, then let's think about colors. So as you may have seen in a previous video, I like a kind of a light gray on the background. Then I like to come in one cell and one column and maybe put a blue. We'll go with that color blue. And then I like to go to Home Borders More, Alt HBM, and go to More Borders and choose the thickest border I can find, relatively dark gray. I'm going to put that on the bottom and the left and then go back and choose white for the top and the right and that gives me this optical illusion that there's a light shining from the upper right and it makes it look like that blue is popping out at us. Right now column A and column L are kind of wasted space so I'll click one, hold down control, click the other and then narrow those columns to about the same size as a row is high. And now I guess would be the right time to actually get my aspect ratio correct now that I'm finished moving the columns around. So I'd copy that, put it in PowerPoint, see if the aspect ratio were correct. If it weren't, I could change columns, rows, insert, delete, change width, height, things like that. Now we are ready to start drawing things on the dashboard. Everything we draw will come from the developer ribbon and the insert palette. We'll use form controls only in this class. We will never use ActiveX controls. ActiveX controls are available to be compatible with much older versions of Excel. All we care about is form controls. If you don't have the developer tab, right click, customize your ribbon, and check this box for developer. Then you should see the developer tab in the insert palette. We can draw a regular button, which we'll, I will get to last. We could assign a macro to that. We could also draw a combo box. A check box. A spin button, a scroll bar, a list box, and an option button. And to make more option buttons, I can just Control C, Control V, Control V, and now I have three. I didn't do a very good job of lining them up. I could try. I don't think I'd pay for software that looked like this, would you? That looks pretty homemade. So let's see what we can do about that. We'll go to Home, Find and Select, and Select Objects. That will change our cursor to an arrow and allow us to click and drag to select those three items. With all three of them selected, I can go to Shape Format, Align, Align Left, Align, Distribute Vertically. That looks more professional than before. Now, Option Buttons, typically we have more than one group, so I need to tell Excel that these three belong in a group together. So I'll choose a group, draw it around those Option Buttons. Now, you would think that if I did three more over here, they would act separately. Let's try that. This is a part of the video you might want to pay a lot of attention to. Copy, paste, paste, select, shape format, align, align left, align, distribute vertically. 
I'm going to go back to developer, insert, and choose a group. Now sometimes these don't work the way we think they would. So let's see what happens. If I click the first one, oops, I'm going to undo that because I accidentally moved it. I'm going to double click down here, click on one. Now you'd think I'd be able to click the second one here. Let's see if it works. It does. Had I not had this group box, I'll hit delete. And had I not had this group box, I'll hit delete. Now they all act together. They act as if there's one big group box around them and I can only select one of the six. So I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup here. Add the group boxes back in by hitting undo a couple of times. I want to align the group boxes to the top. So I'm going to hit shift and click both of them. Shape format, align, top. And now I want to align each button within each group box. I need to go back home, find and select, select objects, choose one, hold down shift, choose another. Shape format, align, align top, choose one, hold down shift, choose another. Shape format, align, align top, choose one, hold down shift, choose another. Shape format, align, align top. I will be very picky on grading these that you've got things aligned as nicely as you can to make this look as professional as possible. If these things are zigzagging down through here or if these look like they should be aligned with each other and they're not, not good. Now let's move on and talk about how each of these controls work. So the easiest one is probably a checkbox. So let's say we didn't know if we were going to be in a tax paying situation. And if we are in a tax paying situation, let's say it's true. And if we're not, let's say it's false. And so how would we work that into our model? Our taxes, let's say we would use the formula that we wrote and say, if we're in this tax paying situation, if that's true, then use the formula that we wrote, otherwise use zero. And let's just see how well that works. Copy that down. I guess I need dollar signs on this to copy it down. And so if, instead of true, if this were false, then my taxes go to zero. True. They go back to the number that we calculated. Well, I guess that's okay, but typing true in that cell seems kind of silly. What I'd rather do is put it right here. I'm going to get rid of these items. And since I'm going to link it to that checkbox, I'm going to color it yellow. That's my standard for all these linked cells. And so if I right click on the checkbox and say format control and link it to this cell, I'd also like to give this 3D shading. Watch what happens when I click 3D shading and say OK. I just think that looks a little nicer. And now when I click this box, it changes the true to a false when it's checked and so forth. And so by clicking the box here, I can change the numbers here. So click, they go to numbers, click, they go to zeros. And so we did that by putting an if statement in here that checked to see if something was true and then did some math. And the something that it checked was true was this linked cell. And we linked it by right clicking and saying format control and linking it to that cell. So a checkbox is probably the simplest and it worked really well. The problem is checkbox three doesn't tell us anything about taxes. So let's change the text on that. I could right click. And sometimes it will come up and let me say edit text. If it doesn't, then I'll just right click and use my delete key to delete the name of the box and say taxable status. And so if we're in a taxable status, then let me zoom out a bit. If we're in a taxable status, we pay these taxes. If we're not, then they go to zero. So that's the, a good example of how a dashboard would help us 
change how our model works without allowing the users of our model to get in there and start messing around with formulas. So what else can we do with some of these things? Perhaps the next easiest control to work with is the spin button. And let's say I wanted to use it to control how many lawns per year. We're going into our model. Lawns per year is here. This is our taxable status. Get a label out there. So lawns per year. We're going to link a cell here. So I'll color that, color that yellow. I'm going to right click, format the control, and give it a cell link right here. This one happens to be 3D shaded already. And now when I spin the button, it changes the number of lawns per year. So there are a couple of things I want to do. I'd like to be able to see on the dashboard how many lawns per year I'm doing. So I'm going to refer it to the linked cell. And I would also like to run my model based on what's in the linked cell. So now when I use the spinner to increase the number of lawns I'm doing, it changes every number that's this linked to that directly or indirectly on my model. I could do the same thing over here with a scroll bar. In this case, I'm going to call it price per lawn. I will link it to cell D30. Say OK. I will point cell my price per lawn from the model input to D30. And then I will tell the dashboard to see what the price per lawn is. And now when I start using the scroll bar, I'm going to make this one vertical or horizontal for now. When I start using the scroll bar, I can control the price per lawn either a dollar at a time, or if I wanted to click in here and move it a larger amount, I could right click, format control, and say the page change were 10, so it's already doing that. So that would let me go $10 a time. So the scroll bar is just a little bit expanded functionality from the spin button. It's a spin button plus this slider inside that allows us to do the page change and I guess would also allow us to pick it up and move it. And so both of these, when you format control, this is very important, both of these have a minimum value and a maximum value that they'll accept. They also have an incremental value and then the scroll bar has a page change value. The limitation is that the minimum and the maximum have to be no less than zero, no greater than 30,000, and the incremental change can be no smaller than one. And so we will have to do a little bit of creative math here in a moment. An example of some creative math might be if our tax rate also had a spin button, so let's put tax right here, link it, link tax rate here, and then show us on the dashboard what the tax rate is. And let's do another spin button, developer, insert, spin button, put it right here. Didn't uh, format control, cell link, put it right here. Now let's see what happens. We can change our tax rate from four to three, five to six to seven. But seven here translates to 700% here. What you'd like to be able to do is come to format the control and have the incremental change be like 0.01. So we can count 1% at a time. If I try that, look what happens. It changed my incremental change from 0.01 back to zero. That's because each of these numbers, minimum value, maximum value, incremental change, and even page change on a scroll bar, have to be 
non-negative, that means zero or positive. They have to be between zero and 30,000 inclusive, and they can't be decimals. So we can only count by whole numbers from zero to 30,000 using a spinner or a scroll bar. So what does that mean for us? That means if we want to go from, let's say, 10% tax rate to 50% tax rate, I'm going to have to get creative. I can't go from 0.1 to 0.5, but I can go from 10 to 50 with an incremental change of 1. And then my tax rate will go from 10 up to 50 with an incremental change of 1. But here, I'll just take the number that the spinner is controlling in the linked cell and divide it by 100, make it a percent. And I'll do the same thing here. I'll divide by 100. And now I've tricked the model. I've tricked the spinner. So I'm dealing with tax, rate, tax rates around 20% up to 50%. But I'm doing that by using a linked cell that goes from 10 to 50 in whole numbers. And so that's a simple example of a mathematical transform that we could use to get around this non-negative integer from 0 to 30,000 limitation. Okay, let's move to the next item. Let's do a list box. And let's say for our investment, we could have a $5,000 mower, a $6,000 mower, and a $7,000 mower. I'm going to move those down one. And then this will be my linked cell. And I want to set this up such that if I choose the first item on the list, the input range being these three, the cell link being this one, and I like to 3D shade when I can, then I can come up here and choose the top one, and I get a one, choose the middle one, and I get a two, or choose the third one, and I get a three, and so on, for as long as this input range is. Now how do I fix this cell to look to choose the right number based on this value? And the short answer is index. So if I use the index function and look at a list or an array, and then comma, tell it which row number I want off of that array, now I can change this value from five to six to seven. And yes, I did grow up in a small Oklahoma town, but we did know how to spell lawnmower. So I can go from five to six to seven by choosing this. Now a list box is no different than a combo box that just stays open all the time. So I also could have used the combo box, right click, format control, input range, choose my three cells, cell link, choose my linked cell, and 3D shade it. And you'll notice that if I choose the first one, I get a one in the 5,000. If I choose the second one, I get a two in the 6,000, and so on. The third item gives me a three in the 7,000. Now right now I've got both of these controls linked to the same cell. So when I change one, it changes the other one. That's silly, we'd never do that in practice, but it just shows you that we could do that. We could even link an option button to the same cell and then get the same effect out of our option buttons. 5,000, 6,000, and 7,000. The one shortcoming of the option button is that we can't point this text down here at the values in the spreadsheet. So we are forced to come in here and just edit the text manually. 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. Now some people like this. This may be more intuitive or for whatever reason preferable than a list, preferable to a list box or a drop down box, combo box. What I don't like about it is if I came in here and said, you know, I want to change those. I want to make them 4,500, 5,500, and 6,500. Then the list box, since it's looking at the input range, D35 to D37, 
it automatically updates. And for the same reason, the combo box automatically updates. But I would have to go in there and manually update the option box, option buttons. And so this would be our investment. I think these look a little nicer on a dashboard perhaps, but I think these are a lot easier to work with because of this dynamic input range. Now we've looked at all the different types of controls except for the macro button. Now we haven't learned VBA yet, but if you know VBA, you may know that you could right click and assign a macro. Now I have a whole lot of right macros written, but let's say I didn't. Let's say I needed to write a new macro and I wanted it to be in this module in this book. And I wanted that macro to say message box. This is the first program that every programmer writes. Hello world. And now when I go back to Excel, let me edit the text on that button. I'm going to call it say hi. And it pops up this message box that we programmed it to. Now you don't know VBA yet, perhaps. You haven't learned it in this class anyway. And we can work on that later. But one thing you might be interested in doing is zooming this to fit in your entire window. So I'm going to change that, edit the text, and call it zoom to fit. And then I'm going to record a macro. And I'm going to record it in this workbook. I'm even going to give it a shortcut key, control, and I'm going to hold down the shift key and press Z for zoom. And I'm going to say OK. Now I'm going to select my dashboard area, go to view, and zoom to selection. I'm going to stop recording, and if you're familiar with VBA, you could go look and see what that code looked like. What that code looks like is select this range and then activate this cell, which we don't even need. I'm just going to delete that and then zoom to the active window. And we should also probably name the macro. Zoom to fit selection might be a good macro name for that. Now this is not the place where you learn VBA. This video is not about VBA, but if you know of something you want to do, or if you have some code you want to use, this is how you would assign it to a button. More likely you would come ask me for some help and we could find the code you needed. I'm going to zoom back out and pretend like I opened this on a different computer with a different screen size. I could hit that button, but first I would have to assign the macro to it, zoom to fit selection. Yeah, so if I open this on a different computer with a different screen size, I could hit that button and it would automatically zoom in to that screen size. It's kind of weird to have that stay gray. So after it zooms, I'm going to say range A1.select. And now when I zoom, it zooms in and then sends the cursor up to here. So we have now talked about each of the different types of controls available to you on developer, insert, form controls. And we talked about linking cells and we talked about the limitations on the spin button and the scroll bar numerically and how we may have to do a little bit of creative math to perhaps divide something by 100 to convert it to a percent. Or if I wanted to buy a lawnmower worth more than $30,000, I'd have to multiply by something that I'd link to. We'll do some practice problems on those. Hopefully this will get you started on your dashboards.